baptism. But Paul's baptismal language is very realistic in the sense that Paul really does. I mean, people like my dear friend and colleague, the good Methodist Jimmy Dunn, uh, tried to argue many years ago that when Paul talks about baptism, this is just a metaphor for being sort of plunged into Christ. I, I just don't think Paul's hearers would have got that. I think when mm -hmm. he said you're baptized into Christ, they would think of the time when they were splashed down in real, physical, literal water. Um, this is not a metaphor. Um, it has metaphorical overtones. One of the backgrounds which helps me understand that is the story of the Exodus. In Romans, you get this sequence of events where in Romans 4, God makes promises to Abraham, promises which are about him inheriting the world, which is interesting because in Genesis he's promised the land, but Paul, like some Jews, Jews of the time, have seen that that's an advanced signpost for the whole world. But then what happens to Abraham's family is they go down to Egypt where they're enslaved, they are rescued from Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea, they get to Mount Sinai where they're given the Torah, and then they journey on their way home to their inheritance. Now, you chase through Romans. Romans 4, you have Abraham being promised the world, then Romans 5, Paul stands back and sums it up in terms of the whole Adam Christ story. But then we get the sequence. Romans 6, you were slaves, but you come through the water, and so you're on your way to freedom. Romans 7, you arrive at Mount Sinai, and you're given the law. Only the law is now a big puzzle, and you're wondering what it's going to do to you. And Romans 8, you are journeying, led by the Spirit, on the way home to your inheritance. Paul has written a Christian version of the Exodus, Exodus story with baptism being not some mysterious bit of sympathetic magic, but the Exodus moment when you leave behind the world of slavery to sin. And therefore, interestingly, he appeals to baptized Christians to live up to their baptism. He says, in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, in effect, don't you realize what happened to you in baptism? Right. Um, all those people left Egypt under Moses, but um, some of them didn't have a clue what was going on, and so God had to overthrow them in the wilderness. Watch out. But if you are baptized, you really are part of the company who is now journeying on towards this new creation. And you better jolly well get on board with that. Therefore, put to death, therefore, all that is earthly in you. Therefore, reckon that you are, in fact, dead to sin and alive to God. And I know that the reckoning in the holiness tradition and in the kind of second blessing tradition was often a sort of, first I've been justified and saved, and then I have to reckon that I'm dead to sin, and then I'll never be able to sin again. I don't think that's what it is. Mm -hmm. I think Paul is talking about status. You have to do the math. You have to add it up. I am in Christ. Christ died to sin. Therefore, even though sin comes and actually whispers in my ear and shouts at me and lures me and all the rest of it, I can turn around and say, just get lost. I don't belong to you. I'm not a slave anymore. I'm not going back to Egypt anymore. Mm -hmm. And I find that exodus rootedness of the narrative that Paul has there really helps me to get a, a depth purchase on what's going on. How do you, how, how do you har harmonize the baptism part of that with his autobiographical claim that I don't think he connected with baptism. I have been crucified with Christ. Ah, I'm ah, now alive in ah, him. It ah. is no longer I in, who in, lives, in but Galatians he lives. two. I mean, yeah. I, th I, I don't think you can dissociate that from baptism. He doesn't mention baptism in Galatians two, and I'm wary of smuggling it in where it's not mentioned. But when he does mention baptism, it's yeah, so it's yeah, so very yeah, close to sure, that sure. that it looks as though it may be the same thing. But for Paul, it's a complete change of identity. And you know, we in the West, particularly my tradition, where we've had indiscriminate infant baptism in parts of the UK for a very long time, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to talk about baptism with the same sort of meaning as it has, say, in a, go to a country like Pakistan today. Mm -hmm. Somebody mm -hmm. gets baptized, yeah. Yeah. everybody knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. You are leaving this community, you are joining this community. Right, it right. really is a death to that whole identity and the mm -hmm. structures and the networks and all the rest of it. And it's a coming alive to this new one, which is very scary. And in many countries of many traditions today, if somebody gets baptized, uh, they may not live very long. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. it's a dangerous mm -hmm. thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that sometimes people of other faiths recognize the huge importance of baptism better than, than we Christians yeah. recognize yeah. it ourselves.